Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, the text this morning is like 41 verses long, and I'm reading it all. Um, so, yay, yay. Um, so, I'm going to read, I'm going to read it, um, and uh, because it's the whole story. There's just no way you could just separate out everything that's going on. Plus, I'm not going to teach on it all, so I want you to know the whole story. Anyway, you can go home and, and read it as, as well. But before I read this story, and I, I, I certainly <laughs> was aware before I spoke at the nine, uh, maybe more aware after um, the nine, and even as I conversed with people um, here. Jesus is going to tell a story, and this story is, it, addresses, it, it addresses the people in the synagogue. In a way, it addresses the church, so this is kind of an odd morning where we're kind of in the system that Jesus is trying to break us out of, but I'm, we're speaking from within it, um, and um, when Jesus wants us kind of out of it, and so that is, but I, I would just say this. Um, anytime you, you have a given gathering of people, there are people here who have been in, in church their whole lives, and in a way, you've, you've been part of the system and, and part of um, the reality, and we're going to talk about that, and um, you've, you've maybe had good experiences, you maybe have had bad experiences. There's also uh, people here this morning that maybe, maybe at one time in their life, um, they were part of a church, um, but somewhere along the line... Um, that uh, because the, the, the system is completely broken, as Jesus is going to point out, the experience wasn't very good for you. You've been hurt. Um, you've been crushed um, by the church of Jesus Christ. Um, and Jesus is going to talk about that today. And, um, and it's sometimes hard to speak within that when you are that and you're asking people to, to engage you and, and to, uh, you know, consider a church as your home. And for that, um, for that, I'm sorry. And then there's other people that, um, and, and part of the reason you left is because of the system. <laughs> um, but there's also people maybe here this morning that uh, have never really been churched. Um, you've never really partaken of it, and one of the reasons you have is because you've heard all kinds of horror stories that maybe some of them are actually true um, about the church, and um, I think Jesus speaks to this, and, in, and he speaks in such a way, it's a hard, this is, this is hard, um, this text, um, because whether you maybe end up feeling comfortable with where I land um, as far as where Jesus is working out this and this day, there is no doubt in the text that something is going on and it's being emphasized over and over again and Jesus is speaking against it. And what he is speaking against is going to make us very, very uncomfortable. So I'm just giving you um, that warning, but I am going to fall into the place where I just trust him and that he loves me. Um, and he loves us, and he loves you, and um, it's where his spirit will take. I'm going to read all 41 verses um, uh, statistically, and, um, and psychology would tell us that you're not going to last the 41 verses, <laughs> um, but I'm going to read them anyway, and it's a fun story, so I'm going to try to make it fun as I read um, this particular story about a blind man. Let's go. We're going to roll through it, and then we'll come back to the first slide. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent us. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with some saliva, put it on the man's eyes, and go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed, and he came away seeing. Well, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, well, is this, this, is this the guy that was used to sit and beg? And some said, well, yep, he is. Others said, nope, it only looks like him. But he insisted, I am, I'm that guy. <laughs> well, then how were your eyes open, they asked. I mean, that's a crazy question to ask this guy. How are your eyes open? Well, this dude, he spit on the ground, he made some mud, and he told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and I can see. Well, where is that man? Well, I don't know. They asked him, I don't know where he is. Well, so they had to bring religious people. They had to bring some God talker like me in, you know, to the man who born blind. Now, 
Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Uh-oh, there's the problem right there. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. Now, now the people of God talkers asked him, I don't know, man, spit, mud, wash, I can see. <laughs> Some of the Pharisees said, this man can't be from God because he breaks rules. <laughs> okay. But others asked him, how can a sinner even do something like that? Because he broke the rules. <laughs> so they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man and says, well, what do you have to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, well, I, the way he doesn't know, I, he's a prophet. They still not believe that he had been blind and received his sight. So they had to go get his parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one that was born blind? How is it that he can now see? Well, we know he is. Yes, he's our son. And we know he was born blind, but well, I don't know. He opened his eyes. We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. I mean, they threw their own kid under the bus. Anyway, 22, his parents said this because they were afraid. I mean, the poor guy, even his parents, they're afraid. They throw him under the bus. Who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged Jesus was the Messiah would be thrown out of church. <laughs> That's why his parents said, well, go ask him. He's of age. Yeah. So, back comes the blind man. He summoned, says, give glory to God by telling the truth. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, well, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. I don't know. All I know is I used to be blind and now I can see. <laughs> well, then they asked, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And the third time, he just didn't going to tell the spit story, you know. <laughs> he answered, I already told you and you did not know Melissa. Listen, now he's feeling a little feisty. He goes, do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? ruh -ro, no, no, they don't want to become his disciples. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are, his, you are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Well, the man answered, well, that is really remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, but he opened my eyes. You're religious people. You should know where somebody opens my eyes comes from. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to godly people who do his will. Nobody has ever heard of the man opening the, uh, someone opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now they're mad, and they say to this replied, You are steeped in sin at birth, which reflected why they felt he was blind. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out of church. Jesus heard that he had thrown him out of church, and when he found him, he says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Well, this is, he doesn't even have faith till now. And the man asked, tell me so that I might believe in him. And Jesus says, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him and said and asked, are, are we blind too? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you see, your sin remains. Whew. 41 verses. <laughs> they clapped in the first service too. I guess it's amazing that I could read 41 verses at one time. You can start on the uh, thing. My pad is down today, so I'm going to be using my phone. Um, I think the first thing, and I know I read that fast, and if you wanted to go back and read it again... Um, there is a central kind of theme and question that's running through all of this text that Jesus is coming up against. Um, and you kind of have Jesus, and then you kind of have the synagogue leaders. You kind of have the context of a, a religious system. But let me just say this. You cannot read this story, this story of the religious leaders, you can't read this story and not at least begin to um, think that one of the main things that everybody is trying to figure out in this story is who sinned. That's always a religious context. You got, that's not my words. Read the story. Is Jesus a sinner? Are the parents sinners? Is this man born blind sinners? 
are the witnesses sinners. It keeps coming up over and over and over again because the religious system, the religious system is always trying to figure out who is right and who is wrong so we can put people into categories as to whether they're good or bad. We always want to know who the sinners are. That is always the context of that religious system. It's been the context of every religious system since then. It is the context of even the church of Jesus Christ. We're always trying to figure out who the sinners are. And you can't read this text and become abundantly clear that Jesus doesn't care. And you can't say that within the system because now you're evaluating whether I am good or bad because we're so steeped into the system. <laughs> we're so steeped. You are evaluating whether that was a good statement or a bad statement. Am I a good person or am I a bad person? We cannot get rid of it. That's how steeped we are. Jesus the question of the religious system, it always has been, go read the book of Job in the Old Testament. And what are his friends trying to figure out? Who the sinner is and where it happened. And God, God isn't. It was at this point in the service that Gene Russell, Gene Russell piped up his hand and said, everyone, you know, we're always trying to figure out who the sinners are. He raises his hand and says, we all are, which is the point. <laughs> we don't have to really figure this out, okay? Let me in on a secret. We all are, okay? There, we're over with that. We are. And Jesus, you know, he says, well, he says, well, neither this man sinned or his parents, and he's not saying they never sinned. They would fall into the category of sinners. But what he is saying, he's saying to their question again. They're, of course, Jesus has asked a question. He doesn't answer it the way they want it. But his answer is kind of the great whatever. Why was this man born blind? We want to find a category for it. We want to find a reason for it. Did he do something good? Did he do something bad? If he's blind, that's bad. He must have done something bad. His parents must have done. We want to get into that system of reward and punishment, uh, Christianity. And Jesus, Jesus says, you know why this man was born blind? So that you can watch me set people free. That's why he was born blind. So you can watch me set people free. Jesus is interested in making someone dirty so that they could be washed. I mean, even Jesus' miracle. Do you know why we have eyelashes? To keep dirt out of our eyes. So if you want to make someone see, you don't throw dirt into their eyes. And by the way, this is a little side note. Jesus, like, never performs miracles in any one certain way. I mean, he could have just said, right? Did he need to spit? Did he need to make mud? Did he, did he need to do anything? He could, we know he's done miracles and say, hey, you can see, and the, and the person sees. I think one of the reasons is for that is because if Jesus did everything the same way, we would try to duplicate it. It's not us. It's him. We're not here to duplicate something and find some kind of formula for how something works. He also did this to poke the bear because there was specific religious Sabbath laws that said, the actual word for mud there is clay, and you're not supposed to do anything with clay on the Sabbath. That is considered work. So even as Jesus is telling and making clay, he knows he's poking um, the bear. So Jesus does his miracle, he spits, he makes clay, then he literally, I mean, there's humor in this, he tells a blind man to go somewhere. <laughs> like, he actually tells the blind man to do something he can't do. It's like, if he were here, why don't you just go down to 
Three Sister Springs and, and wash your mud off. Okay, well, how's it going to get there? <laughs> That's another thing. This is, and actually, I evolved during the week. If I were, if I were, I had, my sermon title is I Can See Clearly Now. If I were uh, naming this sermon now, I would call it Holy Spit. <laughs> and even that, you're going to evaluate whether I'm a good guy or a bad guy. Should I have said that or should I not? We cannot get away from our evaluation and categorizing people. I'm always very aware of that. Um, and the Lord has to set not just me free, all of us free um, from, from doing that. Um, and, uh, but anyway, he's healed. And, and actually, honestly, after he healed, so that's the first seven verses he comes home singing the whole rest or seeing the whole rest of the passage is and this is where I'm going to fly through it is a trial begins to take place setting people free God's kindness God's grace and God's mercy and God's love will always be put on trial by the religious system always there's nothing that makes the religious system more mad than unadulterated freedom, mercy, love, and grace. And the rest of this is a complete trial of not only Jesus, but of that gospel itself. And um, so we have it um, there, you know. The free man, in a sense, is... On trial. Listen here as you read this text. The system is not put on trial by the system. Jesus is on trial. The system's not on trial here with these folks. The system is on trial. On trial. I mean, he immediately gets peppered. Oh, your eyes open. Where is he? You know, and the guy keeps saying, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, he doesn't know anything, you know. But, but what they are saying is, is they are saying is, I don't care how you were set free. I don't care how you were freed from your blindness. If the man sinned and broke a commandment while he's doing it, it's evil. But here's what happens in the system. And it may go back a slide. I know I'm all over the place because I'm jumping around. But here's what happens in the system who is only considering and concerned with what category you're in. A system that only considers who the sinners are. Humanity loses its value. This man was born blind and a beggar from birth. I am sure he sat somewhere the same day over and over and over again. He seemed to, but no one knows if this is the guy because no one ever paid any attention to him because they had a category for him. They had a category for him. Is this the guy? Who's, well, yeah, I think he is. Nope, it's not. It's someone who looks like him. I mean, they are so unsure of who this guy is, they drag the parents in to say, is this your son? Because that's what the system does. The system that only is worried about who the sinners are is never interested in you. It's never interested in you. It's interested in what category you belong to. The system only cares about who the system only cares about figuring out who the sinner is. And I already told you, we don't need a system to tell us that we all are, okay? That that's just not even in the equation. That that's a simple answer. The disciples even did this. This man is born blind. And this, 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 this beginning part of the story, this man is born blind. And the disciples only think this man is some kind of 
tool to ask Jesus a religious question. They didn't care about the man and who he was and how to take care of him. They just wanted a religious question answered. That's who the guy was to them. That's right. <laughs> that would be your sermon. <laughs> And Morgan actually would be better preaching at this because he bucks the system more than I do. <laughs> I want to get paid. That's terrible. But you know that's true. I had a seminary professor tell me this one time. Honestly, it was my first day of seminary class, and it has profoundly affected me. Um, my whole my whole life. He looked at us. I walk into seminary, first class I'm in, it's called Intro to Theology or something like that. And he looked at each one of us and said to us, each one of us, if you make your living by your faith, you will lose one or the other. And that is the most profound statement. And, and it is true. Do the givers like a band? Or do the givers not like a band? Do the, I mean, it's just, it's relentless. In a place where there's categories of always trying to figure out who the sinners are. Who are you? I mean, one simple way I even thought about this. Someone in the church gets divorced. What does the church try to figure out? Who the sinner is. Who's the sinner? We do it. We're relentless at it. People come to my office and they're usually concerned, like they're, 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 they don't want to be the one. And this doesn't go well in counseling either. I just worry, was it my fault? Yes, it was your fault. It was, of course it was. It was that you're, you're a sinner. Of course, of course, of course. Trust and fall on Jesus. we don't need other people putting categories. We put ourselves in those categories. We put ourselves in those categories. I mean, kids in the middle of divorces, they become a tool for their parents to be right or wrong. We get it from birth. I remember my, you know, my kids went to a, a religious school and are, are, are our kids just getting good grades and great at sports so that they can be on the cover of the brochure as the, as the person who is the smartest and the best looking and, and, and the athlete? Do we, do we dress them up? Do we dress them up when we're having a fundraising campaign, bring them into the church and have them stand up in suits and ties and say, give to that? We pimp our children. That's all that is. That's so the system will keep working. That's so the system will work. We don't bring them in and dress them up with shirts and ties when we're not raising money. We're whoring our children because the system is all that matters. We do it with church membership. <laughs> and when we have church membership, how are you going to help make the name of Nature Coast greater? It just becomes a system thing. What category do you fit in? Do you fit in this category? Do you fit in this category? We are so steeped in the system that even as I talk about this, I, I can feel <laughs> I can feel the awkwardness because it's just the way we do things. It's the way we're supposed to do things. I just don't think it's the way Jesus does things. Everybody in this story is trying to figure out who the sinner is. And of course, the system, and I've already touched upon this, will never have any deep value for Christ's mercy, grace, and love and setting people free. And Jesus is proof positive that in the system-breaking message of his mercy, grace, and love, that the person who, in this case Jesus, who is showing his mercy, 
grace and love is the one they actually have determined in the story. Go to verse 24. They've determined who the sinner is, and his name is Jesus. The sinner is the one that healed the blind man. The sinner is the one who offered his grace and his mercy. The sinner is the one who probably knowingly poked the bear and made clay on the Sabbath when he knew their rules said it wouldn't be that way. That's the sinner. The sinner is the one who's offering God's grace, his love, and his mercy. And somehow in the system, the gospel becomes evil. And we try to kill the gospel to fit into the system. Religious people are always upset when you talk about God's love, his mercy, and his grace. And all this dude ever does is say, I don't know all about those crazy theological arguments. I just know I was blind and now I see. Parents, they're still trying to figure out when they talk to the parents who sinned. Parents kind of are on trial. And they throw him under the bus too. He doesn't even have identity with his parents in the system. In verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind, gave glory to God by telling the truth. And they said, we know this man's the sinner. And they're talking about Jesus Christ. That's what the system does. It makes Jesus the sinner, the one who offers outrageous, unstoppable grace, becomes the sinner. Verse 28, I will only say this. They kind of expose themselves because they actually then call themselves the disciples of Moses. Well, no, duh. That's probably the truest thing they've said. But John had already said in his first chapter that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's so many statements. Does God listen to sinners? That statement is made. So some of the things the man said actually isn't true in the gospel either. Guess God listens to sinners. Read the story of the public and the Pharisees. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Thank God he listens to sinners. Call out for his mercy and his grace. If God doesn't listen to us sinners, we have no hope. In fact, you can only make the case at at the end if we're blind, and that's a spiritual metaphor for our own sin. The only people God ever does listen to is sinners. So if you're ever interested in not being a sinner, it doesn't seem he actually will hear you. The system has to be preserved. And you know when this man finally gets faith in Christ in the story? Go to the, keep going to where Jesus encounters a man. Down, maybe, right here. Where does the man encounter faith in Christ? Outside the system. Outside. He's been thrown out of the church, probably the best thing that ever happened to the guy. (laughs) Jesus heard that he had been thrown out, and he found him, and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? He says, well, I don't even know. I mean, he's been through all of this. He still doesn't know. He still doesn't know who the Son of Man is. Tell me. Tell me who the Son of Man is. He isn't even equated that the one who made him see is a savior. And Jesus says, you now see him. In fact, he's the one giving the word to you himself. Tony Rometty sits back there in the first service. When he heard that, he came up to me after the service. He always has a word for me. And he says, I heard Jesus this morning speaking through your mouth. My words don't save, but Christ's words are. And honestly, 
I have the easiest job in the world because really all I ever need to say is take and eat. Take and eat. It's the promise. It's the promise of this one who sees us. So if you're coming for communion or helping with communion, uh, come. And um, if you are singing, you can come. The way we do the table here is um, you come down an aisle and you just take. You can take it back to your seat. Um, you can eat it while you take it. That's the way I typically do. But many people take it back to their seat. They pray. Um, they engage. Um, they engage Christ um, in that way. Um, who can come? Who can come? You know, at the end of this story, as Jesus stands there, and really this would be more than from the story, it, it, Lazarus, Jesus raising from the Lazarus is coming up. Jesus is beginning to tell the story and answer the question of the religious. Where are the sinners? Where does the sin go? And Jesus is saying, I'll tell you where the sin is. It's right here on me. Because John also said in John 1, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And while we're busy wondering who the sinners are, we never talk about the one who takes away the sin. Or we give it lip service and act like it's not true. And we begin to treat each other as if we're bearing our own sin. Jesus is saying, I know where the sin is. I know where your sin is. It's on me. I've got it. I've got death. I've got all those things. Jesus, in this table, did not come to save a system. He came to save you. And in that way, yes, he came to save his church because we are the church. But he came in his mercy and grace. He came to save sinners, Matthew 1, He will save his people from their sin. So can I say this? Be a sinner. Oh, no, can't say that in this system, can you? Listen, I don't have to say be a sinner because you are. And if you say you're not, John, this very John tells us, you're a liar. So if you say you don't have sin, you just sinned. So come to the table, okay? There you go. That's who we are. I'm not encouraging people to sin. You already set the world record for sins. Every one of us has. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And have him touch you and heal you and breathe life into you. Outside the system, we even set up a system for the table. Are we sinning by the way we do the table or are we not sinning by the way we do the table? We cannot get out out of that and Jesus is standing outside the system I was having a combo with Amy this week about this and church and just life and life you know I had a weird week with my family <laughs> and, and there's this realization that in and, and a system that I believe one of the callings of my life is to try to shatter the system and know that you stand with Jesus. And Jesus' categories are not good people and bad people. They are, do you trust me or do you not trust me? That's his category. That's Christ's category. Do you trust him or do you not trust him? And the minute you get up 
from your seat to come take this table, you are saying with your feet, I trust him and him alone, his body and his blood. So come and take and eat of the only thing that will ever give you life. Trust in him. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus today. He loves you. He's calling you. So come. As we go, I love Nature Coast Church. I love you all. And I love what God is doing. I love love more. <laughs> We're so worried. You know, the epistle for this week was Ephesians 5. I didn't preach on it. I wanted to preach on that too. The story was too good. But in that Ephesians 5 passage, Paul is saying to the Ephesians, do what is pleasing to God. And we take that verse and we throw it into the system. And we come up with all of these ways. When you actually read Ephesians 5, you know what is pleasing to God? He is saying, trust him. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Without faith, without Jesus plus nothing equals everything, it's impossible to please God. He wants your heart. He wants your trust. He wants you to say, you are my grace. You are my hope. You are strong enough. You are everything. We just sang those words. That's what pleases him when we say it's your grace. When we say it's your hope. When we say it's your strength. When we say it's your joy, that pleases him to no end. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. It is finished. He promised that on the cross, and he does not lie. Go in peace, amen.